So this is a That's Classic episode for the Little House on the Prairie fans. Uh, and it's it's an in-depth one. It's going to be a great one. And we have none other than Allison Arngrim, uh, who played Nellie, of course, on the show. You can you can see her. She's waving. And uh, my co-host today, of course, my my uh, my dear friend, uh, Bob Bergen. And as I always say, voiceover extraordinaire. So um, anyway, Allison, thanks a bunch for being here. Oh, thank you. I'm here too. I'm going to do one of these in my ear because then I can hear me and you and all of us. Yes, it's fabulous. There you go. Hi, how are you? <laughs> We're doing good. We're doing really good. Um, Allison, so we had a lot of fans that wrote in and uh, were really excited, uh, you know, to have the opportunity. I had, I had, uh, in fact, I'm going to start with one. This is, this is a, a woman, uh, her name's Lily, and she literally wrote to me three different times saying, oh, one more, oh one more, one more. So she was very excited. So I'm going to start with her. I think she'd be a good one. So the very first question, did Allison learn anything about the Jewish religion as her, as her on-screen husband and uh, ML, I guess, uh, Matthew, uh, was Jewish? My cousin- Michael Landon. What was that? Michael Landon. Michael Landon. I'm sorry, Michael Landon. Um, we were just talking earlier about the other myth. Anyway, um, and Michael Landon himself was Jewish. My cousins are Jewish, so I'm really interested. Yes. Um, now, growing up in Hollywood, and of course, you know, going to school in LA and having you know, a Jewish agent, obviously, uh, it, it's not like so, there's some towns in America where I meet people, they say, no, I didn't actually meet a Jewish person until I went to college. I'm like, where did you live? Um, but yeah, I was born in New York and raised in LA. So of course, I, I, I knew Jewish people and I knew people who even told jokes in Yiddish. And so, you know, it was like a normal thing. And but then when I got little house, yes, indeed, Michael Land is Jewish. Michael Landon's real name was um, Eugene Orowitz. And uh, his father's uh, Mr. Orwitz, a publicist, and he actually uh, did have a bar mitzvah. Although it's usually your, if you're Jewish, you know this that it's supposed to be through your mother's side. You're officially Jewish unless you convert. And if you're right. just your dad, you have to like go see the rabbi and have a whole process. But you you can pick, and he he did say no. I wish to be Jewish like my dad. So that was his choice, and so he did, went with that. And his funeral was at the Jewish cemetery, and he is buried at the big fabulous uh, cemetery, really close to his TV dad, Lauren Green from Bonanza, yeah. who's also Jewish. And they're in the big fabulous Jewish cemetery in West LA. Um, so yeah, so I knew that. And Michael Landon spoke fluent uh, Yiddish and Hebrew and uh, sometimes did jokes in the church scenes. He'd be setting up the shot for the Reverend Dalton and he'd have the Bible and he'd just <laughs> like start doing stuff in, in Hebrew and doing the prayers. It was like completely hilarious. Um, so I, I wasn't completely in the dark. I knew uh, people who kept kosher and, and what kosher food generally was. You know, the, the Goyam's version of understanding kosher food that, you know, it has to be on the list and obviously not pork. Um, but yeah, when we what? did the episode, Thank God, no pork, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're safe, dude. So it was when they did the episode where Percival's parents come, there's a whole in-depth thing where they start educating Mrs. Olson because she's like, what is going on? What do you can't eat this? He's like, I'm sorry. She's like, but it's not pork. He goes, yeah, but it's not. It. I don't know how it was butchered, so it's not kosher. And, right. and then it's like, don't doesn't you're not having milk it's like no um you let your cat have milk with me and she's like why not because we don't serve milk and meat together and she's like wait what and it's like nope you don't serve milk and meat together. nope 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 no shellfish nope 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 and i knew about this stuff and what i did actually was i did commentary for that dvd one of the editions when it came out and I went and looked stuff up and read up on things and went to a website said that I did proper commentary and said, okay, here's what they're talking about. When he says the thing about the lamb seed that's in his own milk, what he means is, and, and explained the various kosher rules. Also, what was fascinating was in the 1800s, one would say, okay, this episode must have been poetic license because here, Percival Dalton, who's really Isaiah Cohen, somehow changed his name, married a Gentile and she mm -hmm. didn't convert. And they're saying, you know, oh, he can use the church on the Saturday. That, oh, come on, that's not true. It is. In the 1870s, there was a movement. A lot of young men left the East Coast for the prairie, said, we're in a new world. Everything's cool now. Let's go out. Hey, if I need to change my name for business, it's not a biggie. Uh, we're not frightened that we have to do everything exactly, but I, I can marry this girl who's not Jewish. And in small towns, they did meet with reverends who did say, yes, you may use this as your temple on Saturday and perform the necessary rituals to sanctify. That's cool. 
completely, totally is anything that happened in the 1800s that they showed in that episode, which is a trip. So yes, I did do commentary on that and I did learn more about those things, which was totally freaking awesome. Yes. And I will tell you that I just I just rewatched that episode by chance. Yes. I knew we were I knew we were going to be doing this. So I was Come like, on. And by the way, Little House is on twenty four seven someplace. So I'm just channel surfing, and it was that episode. It was the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And and Allison, that episode is a comedy. That is it's one of great. the funniest episodes. Brilliant. With those the two actors that played his oh. parents were delightful. Oh, and the other thing is they were the Coens, which is from the Kohanim, which is a specific group that tended to be more the, the rabbis and the priests and the, the, the select group in the church. So it's a very big deal to be in the 1800s that his family were Coens and he's gone and changed his name and married this non-Jewish woman. So that's why he was having like a what, giant fit. What's the name of that episode, by the way, just so that anybody know what the title Oh, Come is? Let Us Reason Together. Okay, cool. Because I'm sure somebody yeah. else. And you could go, go you could go on Netflix. It's streaming on Netflix. It's on you, yeah. you, can, you can watch Little House 24 hours a day oh, yeah. everywhere, There's all no, over the world. No but yeah, and the other one is there's one, the Craftsman, which is weird. Speaking I love of Matt Laberto. Oh my god, that one is so sweet. Because there's this lovely old man who's building coffins and and he's Jewish. Now at that point, it's it's little Albert is assisting him, and it's all really cool. Except in that episode, we're much younger. Nellie and Willie and her and Mrs. Olson are horrible anti-Semitic, awful people. And I and my brother Willie say terrible things to this man and tell Albert that Jews have horns, that he's wearing a hat to cover the horns on his head. And it's like, oh, yikes. And then it's like three years later, she's marrying a Jewish man. So it's I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a little house of the prairie. Um, but it was very, and then of course I have the babies and then we decide to divide that Jennifer, Benny and Jenny, Benjamin, Jennifer, that um, one child will be Jewish and one will be Gentile, which no, you really can't do. If you talk to your local rabbi, they will go, yeah, no, that's not a thing. But um, Michael decided that would be okay. So. Yeah. And, by, and by the way, N- Nelly never converted, correct? Apparently not. I don't know. Now in the off camera plot line somewhere, in the show, she did not convert, which I'm sure would have been a huge sticking point with his parents. Because like, yikes, will the children be really, will Benjamin, the son, they've decided Jewish be true. Oh yeah, that Jewish, would have been a big convert. one. But, yeah. um, of course, if then if you ask Michael Landon, Ugi Orowitz, he will say, yes, he's still Jewish because his mother didn't convert and it was a thing, it was a thing. Um, but when they moved to New York in season seven, first of all, Lanelli moved to New York because his father's died and they have to help his mother run the store. I'm thinking, they made the move to New York. And since they were running the store now taking care of his mom, that then she converted because then there would there's no rabbi in Walnut Grove, right? So they moved to New York. And I I think in this off-camera canon backstory that she moved to New York and she met with a the rabbi there and converted. And she got a whole okay. new way. And then she got a wig. That's what right. now. So you've just explained why the hair is different. <laughs> That's it. It's a wig because she converted and is covering her hair. Yes, that's a great found it. That's good. You just connected the dots. <laughs> I and like really I said, this is all in my mind. I have scripts, no idea. Yeah. I have no idea what the heck he did. And the real Nellie Owens married a guy named Henry Curry and is buried in um, Forest Grove, Oregon. So no, but there you go. Wow. Okay. Moving on to our next question. Um, this is from Beth. Beth wrote many questions. She is the the person that wrote in and said, "Look." I've seen all the interviews, but I want to ask some questions that we don't hear about. So here we go. Did you prefer to film outside at Big Sky Ranch or on the soundstage? P.S. I know you fainted when it was very hot. 100% prefer to be on the soundstage to the point that (laughs) we'd get the schedule for the week, get the call, she'd go, Uh, not see me um especially because we filmed a lot in the summer because duh then the kids didn't have the three-hour school and so it's you know less you know breaking up the day so it was so hot it still is you could drive out there now Simi valley gorgeous place very built up when when we shot there there was nothing there There there's no town there was was a library and a shopping mall this is lovely now um but Big Sky Ranch, which is huge, and like everything in the world is filmed there. When you're watching TV now, and you're it's like, and it's Big Sky, and that's a Big Sky. Oh, here's a commercial. It's in Big Sky. So everything is shot there. But it gets really hot. So like, if it's in the high, if it's 99 in West Hollywood or LA, yeah, 105 out in Simi, oh, easy. Man. And there were days where it was in August, you know, July, August, September, 110. 
And remember now, this is the 70s. We did not have digital, the, the joy of digital where you don't need the hot lights. Back in the day, and I feel like Mary Pickford describing this, we had the big lights. We had the big 10Ks and the 20Ks with that smoke coming out and the reflectors. So you're out there, it's blazing bright, it's 110, and they're putting lights on you oh. that are physically hot to go with it. There was once that we were in Arizona, and then we'd go to Arizona on location. Oh my God. We were in uh, old Tucson in Arizona, and there was the it was a boxing match, so they had a tent outdoors. They were shooting this in, and it got up to over 120 inside the tent with the lights. Oh my gosh, that's so, insane! And, and I had the dress, and then I had I didn't have the little petticoats. The other girls had I had the big foofy fancy petticoats because the dress. So I had this very heavy petticoat and tights and the shoes and the dress with the sleeves down to here and the collar up to here and the wig. It was really freaking hot. Um, so usually it was a running joke, like, how do you know it's the first day of summer? Um, Allison is unconscious and lying on the ground. And it's like, boom, oh, it must be summer because Allison's out. Get the salt tablets oh and the ammonia capsules. Um, yeah, it was that. It was, I was really prone to heat stroke and passing out. I'm much better now, but I still, but yeah, it was insanely hot. It was so hot. And then it's dirty and uncomfortable. And it was kind of a schlep that the 118 didn't even go all the way there. And then you got there and there's no radio, no TV, no cell phones. We didn't have cell phones. There's radios in the dressing rooms. It didn't work. Right. There's no signal. You still barely get a signal out there. No signal. If you wanted to call anybody, they had to drive you a mile down the road to the farmhouse thing that had a phone. Um, there was, you were trapped. You were incommunicado for nine hours. Oh my gosh. And it was a million degrees and you were covered in foxtails and dirt oh, when you got home. It was, it was location. It was brutal. <laughs> filming on location and it got, it was rough. And it was really hot. So yes, when it was said, hey, this episode's almost all at Paramount. It's like all indoors. Like, yes, oh, yes. thank you. Well, so, so, so I, I know that uh, towards the end of its run, Gunsmoke had built Dodge City in a sound stage. Was there ever a situation or talk where they were gonna do that with Little House with the town? We had things like, okay, the little house, the house and the barn, there were multiple versions. There was a little house and a barn out in Sini, but if you walked into them, there was pretty much nothing in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might dress them a little like for, let's go into the doorway shot, but all those interiors of the barn, the little house, et cetera, and the loft, that was all indoors. But what they did indoors was built a complete thing with a dirt floor. So when it was snowing, mm -hmm. when it was nighttime, like, there's the whole thing, the Christmas episode, and they got the fake snow on the roof and the fake snow blowing, and they got the whole buggy with the horses inside the soundstage pulling up at the door. That was all on a soundstage. So rain and snow and storms and darkness you loved, and things. You loved any kind of bad weather days. Yes, yes. Oh, and when it would rain, we'd have a terrible rain. And of course, Simi would turn into a lake of mud and they'd have to redo the schedule. We'd all be sitting around the soundstage on the rainy day waiting to figure out what the heck they were going to shoot. And we'd be playing board games and hanging out. And it was like, oh, it was awful. We liked, liked wow. it when it rained. Wow. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, this is also from Beth, by the way. It's related to what you were just talking about a little bit. And I'm, I'm curious. Um, here, here it is. As a kid... And when not filming the outdoor scenes that you were in, did you hang out in any of the empty buildings that weren't being used, such as the church or the school? I know these were only shells, but it would be fun to know if the kids hung out in these when they weren't being tutored on set or had some downtime. Well, when we were being tutored, we were in the schoolhouse, which is really weird. So they figured, what the heck? We got the really? building. It's got four walls and a roof. Some of the buildings are more open. This will work. So you go up to in school, you go in, and it was just empty. It was plywood, 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 plywood walls and the windows and the plywood floors. And they'd have two big, long folding tables and a bunch of chairs and um, a couple of space heaters in the winter when we'd all be sitting there wearing our coats, shivering, trying to do homework. Um, so we did our three-hour school in there if we were out in Simi. If we are on the lot, there was a room kind of these green flats, like an office little cubicle setup that we did it there. Um, so we did hang out in there all the time. When they weren't using a building, we were greatly discouraged from creeping around and hanging out in it, although we occasionally did, because God forbid we should move something, God forbid we should break something, which occasionally happened. You'd hear a resounding crash and immediately the crew would go, Jonathan, I mean, Jonathan Gilbert Willie, because it was assumed that he had broken something. Oh because he's usually, gosh. he was the trouble spot. But it was always very funny when you hear crash, and they go, Jonathan, you go, I'm right here. I swear to God, it wasn't me this oh time. <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, so, so when, because there's still lights and things, you could break stuff. You break one of those candy jars or whatever, something. It's like disaster. Also, mm -hmm. the rattlesnake problem. What? Um, in, in addition to the, 
fatal heat and the the fox the foxtails and the the dirt and everything else then there's the poisonous snakes the rattlesnakes is native to california and of course out in simi they're just everywhere oh and um gosh. they love hiding in those old buildings in a nice dark cool wood oh, there geez, on the hot days on. so they would try to clear them like the beginning of filming they'd go like beat the ground and shoo them out like the day before we had to film kind of you know but you were discouraged from fooling around too much because you get your foot in a prairie dog hole and trip or you accidentally step in the brush and there's a snake or you're fooling around in the back of the mercantile and get bit by a rattler then it's a problem did, like did that ever out. happen by the way for anyone on the crew or anybody get get uh, a rattlesnake bite we did not thank god we were extremely careful we had some rattlesnake sightings there were a couple of rattlesnakes found um the only snakes we were, we were up in northern california sonora or the big location like oh the lord is my shepherd when laura runs away to the mountains like all that stuff mm -hmm. up in northern california and it was a nice wet grassy area and melissa gilbert and i were heading over to makeup and we found a whole bunch of snakes now we luckily could identify our snakes and they were definitely garter snakes they were definitely little garter snakes totally oh, safe geez. thank god because we picked them up and we put one between every finger they were little guys and several in our hair and they then we the makeup me. trailers and went ah and cause people to scream and faint and get really mad but <laughs> it was wow. totally worth it wow that's a lot of snakes by the way yes it was a lot of them there was like it was like yeah. a new a litter if you were of snakes which is kind of dangerous because baby rattlers you can't always tell that they're rattlers when they're first born but the markings you no know, they were garter snakes they were definitely non boys in a snake but we, i was now, like we look really they go in my hair they make good barrettes wow wow okay um, there was, you know, you mentioned the candy and I had one there that here, this is, this is uh, um, also from Beth. Um, did Allison, her TV brother, Willie, or other cast members ever help themselves to the candy in the jars at the mercantile when not filming? What, if so, what was her favorite? Was the candy always fresh or did it go stale? Um, yes, yes, and yes. We did sometimes help ourselves, which of course then the kibosh was put on that by the prop men going, hey, hey, stop eating a candy. The parents were like, oh, hey, with the candy. And then also the prop men were like, I got to reset all the candy now. No. So they kept telling us, would you stop already? So they would try to hide it, put it away. And there was stuff they left out. And then of course there's stuff they left out that was really stale. Um, the stuff in the jars was usually fresh. The stuff where they had stuff like in the bins, they were like, don't eat that. Do you know how long that's been there? Eh. Um, they tried to scare us off by threatening us with bug spray because they said, well, you know, the stuff on the sound stage in the bins, we just leave it there because it's temperature controlled. But there are bugs here. And so we've sprayed for stuff. So God knows what's in that candy. So you probably don't want to eat that. Um, I don't know if it had bug spray on it, but it was definitely really stale. So when they shot a scene, they brought out fresh candy. They go, look, when we shoot this scene, we're going to give you fresh candy. If you want candy, just come to the prop truck and ask like a person. And so I did. And my favorite were the peppermint sticks. And I would simply go to the prop truck and say, may I please have some peppermint sticks? But yes, of course, and I get my peppermint stick, which I loved. I also like the gum drops, but those don't keep well. So you have to ask for those. Yeah. Were they like lemon drops, like that kind of a uh... Gumdrops? They had they had really no the real the big gumdrops that came oh, like red and green and yeah. black and oh, licorice wow. and red they were fantastic and jelly beans so the big old fashioned not these stupid jelly belly weird things the big suckers that were like licorice and pink and white and black and red and did old school um, and wow. then the peppermint sticks which are just awesome so yeah gotcha okay that's pretty cool actually I'm glad she asked that that's that's actually really wild that you got to do that all right. How did they get you to cry for scenes such as the one where Percival is about to leave? Oh, that one was easy. Getting people to cry, as you know, a lot of crying on this show. <laughs> there was yeah. so much crying. Um, we had some people who were like, you could go cry. And they were like, uh, Michael Landon and Melissa Sue Anderson, you could go abracadabra cry. Give me any topic and they could just go and like two and down the yeah and uh, she could turn it on michael could turn it on uh when michael cried though he did have a small baby spotlight focused on his chin you know his chin quiver oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah he had a spotlight to enhance that so it, it really stood out <laughs> classic I love it. um love it and then uh, some people cry some people were more method and were like okay give me a minute i gotta like you know really do this um 
And then sometimes they were in a hurry. So if you weren't producing enough tears or worse, you did a beautiful real cry, but you were like cried out and you didn't have anything else running down your face. They bust out the glycerin. That's why you will sometimes see people with a tear that does not seem to be moving. And other times it's like water and other times it's very slow because they've had to break out the glycerin because you either they were crying, but there weren't enough tears or they cried out and didn't have anything else. So you get glycerin. Um, there was the menthol crystals in a tube. If you weren't watering up fast enough, they and and that would really hurt. But you boy, you'd be crying. Um, wow. So they pulled stunts like this. A lot of the time, though, the way things were written and the way Michael directed, things were so emotional. The story was so sad. You were like, I, how can I not cry? People were just bursting. You know, people watching his film were crying. So sometimes it was like, well, that was a little too easy. And he'd, you know, work and cry. And now the day that uh, the scene when Percival left, that was a super duper real cry. I, I had some advantage. Nellie was usually faking crying. Nine out of 10. Right. I cried. I was faking it anyway. And so I was always having to do, ooh, ooh. by the way, I really sound like that when I cry. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> People have watched the show and then they're around me and like something terrible happens and I'm crying and I go, ah! they go, wait, what? Wait, that's real. Oh God. Um, oh, so, so, so I would cry, but then my mother would leave the room and I go, ah, ha, 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 ha. I'm getting another horse and a doll. And a, so I was just like evil fake crying. But Percival says that's it. I'm going, I really cry. And it kind of freaked everyone out because I spent seven years fake crying for candy for a horse for a doll. Wow. And all of a sudden we have a scene where she's a grown up and her guy she's madly in love with is going to go and she hasn't told him she loved him. And she really cries for like once in her life. And so I really cried. <laughs> they almost wow. cut. It was like when we finished the moment to do another setup, it was like, are you okay? Yeah. Do you want to keep going? Yeah. Are you really crying? Yeah. Why? They're like, what? I was like, you guys all cry. What? I finally cry. You freak out. They're like, yeah. So it like oh freaked everyone gosh. out that I actually suddenly cried. And, uh, but it was awesome. It's great team. <laughs> is it, is it, is it in, in, in general, is it fairly easy for you to, you know, go on the mark and, and no, cry? I'm, I'm not an instant crier. Like I said, there are instant mm -hmm. criers, Michael and Melissa is instant criers. Absolutely. There are some people have a talent and I don't know, it's lots of stuff in their tear ducts and they don't even have to even get emotional. They, it's like making yourself sneeze or something. They can go and just like stuff, water starts coming out and then right. they're like, oh, did you want me to be emotional as well? Okay, I can do that too. Um, whereas I'm, I give more method. Okay, why am I crying? You know, um, yeah. I can do it. Clearly it's happened. I have, you know, certainly cried up a storm when necessary, but um, no, I'm not an instant crier. I have to, I have to work my way up to it. Also, you're crying, and as well as the actress that played Mrs. Olson. <gasps> Every time you guys cried, it was comedic. I mean, it was it was yes. definitely people were always laughing. Well, it's like I said, like <laughs> it's, it's how I really cry, though. <laughs> and then people laugh at me, and it's hard. Nice. Um, okay, what was uh, this? Is from Lily. What was your favorite Nelly costume to wear throughout your entire time on the series? Okay, right away, the first year. I mean. What Laura and Mary had two dresses each, and then they got a third in like the Country <laughs> Girls episode when Ma bought the fabric. They literally owned two dresses, and then they got a third. I had four dresses out the door, like before we served. I went to wardrobe fitting, and they just kept bringing stuff out. And I'm going, our dresses are good on this thing. And like Laura's like, we get there. Melissa's like, I have one freaking dress. I got another dress in this episode. You have four dresses. Who are you? Um, so yeah, I got four dresses immediately. There was the wow. blue which of course we call the stunt dress because there were two that was always when something bad's going to happen. It's that blue dress with the puff sleeves. Oh, interesting. Guarantee. I'm going down that. because that's the stunt girl is in the other one. Um, yellow with long sleeves, that lovely pink one with the pinafore, but my absolute, absolute favorite was that year I had a purple taffeta stripe for church. It was purple and black and white, mostly purple and black. I mean, on a kid, wow. who's putting a kid in purple and black? And it was taffeta with velvet trim. Oh my God. It's amazing. Who has a purple and black taffeta velvet trim outfit when you're 12? So I was like, yeah, so that would be my favorite. Uh, oh, then when I take Laura's horse, that Christmas at Plum Creek, I had this coat, this green coat. Oh, I remember that. 
coat like that weird sort of weird uh -huh. peplumy wow. shoulder thing it was like some kind of like a russian soldier like what the heck was i wearing as fat and braid all over it it was like a military uniform or something i had this amazing green coat that i i had a killed for that that I allison that. did you keep any of this just for yeah, fun yeah no kidding damn thing I got, I got nothing um i got it because well first of all they were like they reuse stuff if you watch the episodes really closely you'll see blouses and things i remember that dress things get recycled um some stuff is turned up on other shows props and clothes mm -hmm. uh very rarely like melissa got her little red dress michael had his hat dean butler got his hat i mean people got little teeny tiny things i think charlotte stewart got her glasses as miss beetle um we didn't get a lot they were keeping stuff like no you can't have it um and then when i ended and left in seven years we didn't know that it was like gonna end or when i was gonna leave and then they put my wig on the new kid on nancy so i certainly wasn't taking that anywhere mm -hmm. um i could have gotten the little high button boots that were sort of beigey with the pink leather because the wardrobe lady had them and she said do you want them but i had to pick them up on a certain day and i couldn't make it and she was leaving because she was like moving to the virgin islands so like i don't know my boots are in the virgin islands oh wow okay isn't that crazy i, I got nothing crazy? which is why fans make me stuff i have miniatures of the mercantile and they i have a collection of paintings it's like right there i have a collection of paintings wow. and drawings of the olsen's mercantile and beautiful things that people have made me like replicas. That's cool. oh my gosh you know it's so funny that you say that i i had uh interviewed uh marta Kristen from uh lost in space she said the exact same thing you said that they didn't know and so they ended up not you know she never walked away with anything because and they, it was a different era. It was right. very rare that objects from TV shows became these hugely, insanely valuable right. things. I mean, yeah, in the 70s, you might have said if I had, you know, something from Gone with the Wind, someone would go, well, yeah, sure. that's probably a sure. big deal. But there were like, you know, yeah, the ruby slippers, there's like six pairs, um, those were a big deal. But even then, they weren't as a big deal as they are now. Right. And it was had to be that level. The idea that you were on a TV show and a teacup from the TV show or a saucer or oh. a doily or some tiny object or a pair of shoes was going to be a huge honking deal in 30 years. Ne we just no, nobody got it. Otherwise, right. we'd have been we'd have been stuffing things in our purse. Exactly. All day. Like, exactly. I'll be <laughs> right back. I'm just heading to the car for a <laughs> sec. <laughs> we'd have been ripping the joint off, but we had we had no clue. We had no clue. Wow. OK. Um, and by the way, Bob, good question. That was also June's question. I just want to make sure she gets her name in there. There you go. June. Um, June. Um, okay, here we go. This is from Jessica. What was your worst prank that you played on the show and best prank you you did on the show? What was the now, in, in character, out of character. Oh my God, because it's the thing. Well, why don't you tell us both? Because I'd, be intrigued, I'd be intrigued, intrigued on both of those. There was so much insane pranking going on. The worst offenders being Michael Landon, Melissa Gilbert, and Matt Laberto. <laughs> Actually, in order, it would be Michael Landon, Matt Laberto, Melissa Gilbert. Those three, well, like I said, if they hadn't, if he hadn't been the producer and she had been the lead, he'd get fired for this stuff. They were insane. They had like prank wars, like topping each other, like what can you do to each other? It's just like out of control stuff. Um, like what? Tell us. Well, some Melissa of and I, we did the standard teenage stuff. Um, we, I think I taught her the saran wrapping of the toilet seat. She was a fan of itching powder and things like that. Um, <laughs> if you Man. take saran wrap and you lift up the seat, I should be telling people how to do this. You lift the lid in the seat and you take saran wrap and you put it around the bowl of the toilet super tight. She can't see it. Oh, and God. then you put everything down, oh. people's in it until it's too late. Um, so that's evil. That is a thing that was popular to do. Um, Michael was usually king of the pranks. We usually let him have that. He and Matt had a thing where they were leaving weird notes in each other's dressing rooms and writing things on mirrors as if they were stalker fans. <laughs> and Matt apparently once hung like a clothes making dummy in effigy in Michael's dressing room. Oh my God. Which would totally get you like fired and sent to human resources now. But it was like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> a different time. Uh, <laughs> they thought this stuff was a riot and Michael was always he wanted outtakes he was like I need more outtakes to amuse myself and show on Johnny Carson so there was always weird stuff that he did to get outtakes um so I'm lying there in the episode bunny when I slam into the tree branch and the horse which is fabulous special effects how they did that that I did not of course really ride a horse or hit a tree branch it's a miracle um yep. 
I'm actually sitting on a box going dumpity 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 dump and two guys are holding a sheet of plexiglass in front of me and on cue one guy swings a tree branch into the plexiglass and I go ah and fall over um that's great cool. I just watched it recently I go my god that actually looks real so I'm lying there unconscious to take blood running out of my nose it's great it's cool grass I'm relaxing lying there unconscious and they don't say cut and I'm waiting to hear cut my eyes are closed I don't know what's going on no one has said cut and then Michael sticks his finger up my nose so that he has this <laughs> outtake so yeah it was pretty much like constant yeah wow that's awesome especially knowing that it's Michael Landon who obviously ran the show I mean that's right. he was the, the worst defender he was the worst <laughs> defender for pranks it's just like he was the one you had to watch out for <laughs> Oh my God. I love that story about him sticking his finger in, in your nose. I'm sorry. That's possible. Funny. And you've heard about the frogs in the mouth, the lizards mm -hmm. and the frogs in the mouth thing. Wait, yeah. No, no, okay. No, yeah. Help me out. Uh, Michael would do this. Um, he thought this was hysterical. Uh, he especially liked if there was some woman visiting the set with a big crush on him because that got bigger screams. He would go get a frog or I mean, Melissa go get one because they're little tiny frogs and toads in the little creek and he'd get a frog and he'd stick this thing in his mouth. I, he never oh, swallowed gross. one. Gross. Gross. And he get these, he did this all the time. And he just walk up so high and the frog jump out of his mouth. Um, and, and there's, there is footage of him letting a lizard crawl out the side of his mouth. Oh, I have seen that. oh wow. Wow. Okay. All right. That's real. Yeah. I give him credit. I couldn't even we put that nuts. in my face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. This is uh, from, uh, let's see, Nikki. What is your relationship like now with Melissa Gilbert? Okay, I just been talking to her the other day. Like I said, she's got this whole thing she's doing now, modern prairie, this sort of branding thing. Because she's out, she's up in the woods. She's up there in upstate New York. She's got chickens and a little farm going. She's got like a place in Manhattan and a place. She and her husband Timothy Busfield bought this little place, thinking, oh, for summer vacations, we'll take the grandkids. It'll be great on the weekends. And then the pandemic hit, and they were in the heart of New York and went. I don't want to be here. <laughs> and they got in the car and they went up and said, I guess we're raising chickens and planting crops because, and so now they live there like most of the time they're up in the woods and she likes it. She always liked being out in the, I'm the city girl. She always liked being out of location. And country. That's wild. So she's right. So um, no, we've been talking. She actually came on my interview show and we just did a thing, a uh, fanboy convention in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it was me and Melissa Gilbert and Karen Grassley. And it was a big autograph show and we had a blast at that. And that was funny because she calls me early in the morning, like day one. I'm like, what's up? She goes, um, not all my bags arrived. I don't have my makeup. I'm like, what? She goes, and I'm not even wearing a lot of makeup now because she's embracing this whole earthy, crunchy, like hippie goddess thing. She goes, but I like have nothing. I have like no mascara lipstick. She goes, you have makeup. You always have makeup. You have spare makeup. I go, I'm coming over. And so I like literally, get, we're sharing makeup. Okay. It's like, the, we're like this close. Um, and then the Hollywood show, we did the Hollywood show. That was, we got most of the cast together for that. I and saw that. I regret not going to that. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. So um, yeah, and then we all went to dinner at the Smokehouse. We have a tradition with the Little House gang to go to the Smokehouse restaurant in Toluca Lake. I know it. Because it's next to Forest Lawn and traditionally when someone from the show dies, they either have the funeral at Forest Lawn or they at least have the service at like the Old North Church thing there. Mm -hmm. And so we would all go and then we'd all go to the Smokehouse for dinner and have like a catered thing. Wow. So I we got on the phone. I made a reservation, and we called. We did an email. Say, hey guys, do you want to all go to the smokehouse after the Hollywood show? Because we don't have to wait for someone to die. We could just go to the smokehouse. <laughs> and they went, yes, let's go. So we had so much. Fun. So yes, no, we are friends. Someone once asked me how many little house people do you have on speed dial, and I was like, fourteen. Um, so yeah, That's we're cool. the, the, and and you know, Carrie no, no, and Miss Beetle and Dean. I mean, yeah. Melissa and Tim had a very brief podcast that was so good, yeah, but they, they didn't do that many funny. episodes. They were because they, they were just kind of bored and went like, let's do a podcast. <laughs> they, did, oh, they did a bunch of episodes. And, and it's like him interviewing her about Little House on the Prairie because he's like, I hardly watched it. I filled me in. They're very funny stuff. And then Dean Butler uh, lives in LA. And then um, Ketty, Ketty Lester, who's Hester Sue on the show. You know, she just turned 87. She's back at it. She's singing. So... Oh. She did a thing at the uh, was it the Heritage Museum in Highland, and she sang like three songs and did a Q and A. She liked it so much. She said, "I want to do it again." She just did a show at the Gardenia in Hollywood. Did twelve songs and told stories. Wow! And didn't miss no beats for her eighty seventh birthday. She thought, I said, "I want to get back at it." Came out in a beaded gown and proceeded to do an entire set that at is the so Gardenia. Impressive. Everyone's like, 
I mean, when she walked out, people gasped, went, oh my God, she looks so amazing. She's like, it's she 87. They were like freaking out. And she was amazing. She did it. She did it. And now she's going to be probably be doing a Christmas show. Um, but she's singing. She's singing and performing again. And she was at the Hollywood show and she does autograph shows now. Kenny Lester, Kenny is 87. She's amazing. Wow. So she's like Good that. So I'm big buddies with her. Uh, and then it's just a D Dean Butler romance. So baby Carrie, uh, Rachel Greenbush, the gang, Charlotte Stewart. Um, next week yes yes october 7th the first week in october october 7th uh and 8th that weekend me pat laberto andy garvey dean butler el manzo and charlotte stewart miss beetle are all going to lincoln illinois for a fall pickers market and autograph show it's gonna be awesome and oh, then wow. The next weekend, not the, then the third weekend, the one of the 22nd, that weekend, a whole gaggle of us, me, Charlotte Stewart, oh, and Wendy Lou Lee, baby great. She's awesome. I'm very good friends with baby Grace. She's obviously grown up now. They were twins, lovely girls. Um, baby Grace and Miss Beale and I, we're going to Hannibal, Missouri for Wizard of Oz days. I saw and that. that. So weird. That's interesting. So yeah, yeah, I thought Miss so Miss Beale, Nellie Olson, baby Grace, on Joey boat, Luff. Right? Jo Joey on Luff. Boat. On a, and on a, on a Hannibal, Missouri, Steamboat. Yes, Steamboat. Yeah. It's, it's, the, the, it's, the the, it's the land of Mark Twain yes, with the yes. Little House in the Prairie gang doing Wizard, Wizard of Oz. Yes, yes, yes. I saw it's, that. It's, so, it's insane. <laughs> it's it's the Mark Twain cave complex. I'm yeah. frightened already. And there's a Steamboat. <laughs> and like the night before is the like Red Shoes Gala, like salute to Judy Garland thing, a party. And 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 Joe, Joey Loft, her son. It's good. Judy Garland oh, and Joey right. Loft is going to be. Right. Yes, and then it's yep. all the rest of the day is events and autograph signing and whatnot with me and baby Grace and Miss Beetle. And at one point, we are going to be allowed to dress up. They're going to do us all up. And Charlotte, Charlotte's going to be Glinda the Good because that's totally her personality. She is Glinda the Good. That's and cool. that's I right. suspect, I think Wendy, maybe is Wendy doing Dorothy? I think, yes, yes, I am getting dressed up as the Wicked Witch really of the go. West. Oh, Green Hay, come on, you're going to be loving yards. it. Green? That's kind of why I'm doing it. He's like, do you want to do it? I'm like, can I be the Wicked Witch of the West? Yes, you can. Done. I'm good. Um, so, oh, yeah, so cool. I'm going to go be the Wicked Witch of the West at Wizard of Oz days in Hannibal, Missouri on a steamboat because that makes all the sense in the world. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, I saw that and I read, I read through it twice because my brain was like, Wait, Wizard of Oz. That's why I put like, cast. I went, Wizard of Oz. What? 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 Jury I lost just, weight. A steamboat. What is I happening? And, and what, one of my fans commented, I'm sorry, my brain just exploded. Right. <laughs> like, what I the mean, hell are you doing? It'll be a blast. Awesome. Yeah, it'll huge. be a blast, but huge. so funny. Um, Okay. Oh, well, yeah, right. we all well, get together and do stuff like this. We're like, we're emailing each other. How many photos are you bringing? When's your flight? I think Dean and Patrick and I are on the same plane on Friday this, and then Charlotte, she has to fly in from San Francisco. Yeah, we're like oh. coordinating who's taken who to the airport. I mean, it's like ridiculous. I think that's- Oh, and Mrs. Fair. Garvey, Mrs. Garvey's down the street, uh, uh, Hersha, Hersha parody. Um, yeah, no, it's it's bananas. Uh, that's cool. And I'm sure the fans love hearing that you guys are close. Yeah, that, that's we're all still be. hanging out together. All right, um, let's go back. This was, uh, this was actually another one from earlier from Lily. How long after you filmed an episode did it take for it to actually come out on TV? You know, I'm trying to think. Um, weeks, not days. It was nowadays. It's like it's all digital now. So the whole process of filming it and editing it and making it happen is like very quick. It could be like literally days. And then of course they could also take their time and release all twelve episodes at the same time. It's right, right, yeah. right. What's yeah. a season? Um, but in our day it was Panavision, so like literally you couldn't even see what you've done. If Michael and the crew wanted to see the dailies, they had to wait 24 hours till they developed the film. They have to mm -hmm. go to the drugstore and they developed the film and then they'd watch that and say, okay, that one, that one and find out if they had to reshoot it. And so editing this was a very long process. So I'm thinking like a few, cause I remember we were shooting a Christmas episode and it obviously was not December, but it wasn't July either. It might've been like October-ish, beginning of November, we like shot the Christmas episode. So it was usually, I would say at least four weeks, but we started cranking stuff out in like May, like we our big break, we go on break like February. And so February, March, April, May was, remember they used to have hiatus and pilot mm -hmm. season, but right. had Ah, when there was time and there were calendars um that was a break and people didn't film and then around may you, we'd go back to work and then they'd start airing the new episodes in september so we shoot stuff in may that aired in september absolutely oh, wow that's a so allison i have i have yeah. a question 
regarding all that. So there were some characters like the gentleman that played your father or Reverend Alden. They wore the same costume for every yes. single episode. Would they ever shoot multiple episodes because they needed the mercantile for like four scenes and four different Rarely. episodes? Let's just do this. The only time we did multiple episode stuff is if we were on location, location. If we got on the plane and went to Sonora, to Northern California, which uh, Twain Hart and all that, the big the big Stanislaus River and that mount, the mountain that Ernest Borgnine is on when Laura mm -hmm. runs away from home. If we were out there or we were in the desert for hot air, anything involving a hot air balloon, Indians, a dunk tank, it's, it's, it's a desert area. Um, if we were there, they would say, okay, we're doing these. We would, do, there might be three different things. We might be shooting pieces from three or four things generally. Usually, usually they were like back to back. Well, we're shooting like the camp out in this and they were like near each other, but you might shoot some because you're all the way the heck, you know, a flight away, but maybe two or three things, not a lot. I know there's shows like, wasn't like my three sons. They shot, yeah, they that shot like correct. all, right. they shot all of Fred McMurray stuff. And he went, mm -hmm. bye. It like shot an entire year of Fred McMurray, And then he'd like leave and they had to shoot. Ryan, yeah, Ryan yeah we weren't that freaky. Way. That was yep. freaky. That's the other far end of the spectrum. Yeah. We, yeah, we would shoot that if we were behind. I remember like, well, like when there was the actor strike and things got held up. I remember when I was shooting Fantasy Island, they were shooting two or three episodes at the same time and they were running back between sound stages. It was insane. Mm -hmm. um, so we weren't that bad, but we might shoot a little bit and say, yes, we need to get this piece in the can for next week because of scheduling, but very rarely, very rarely. Right, so so I have another question because it's popping in my head and uh, John- Let's Cut to Bob Bergen for the next That's question. right. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> so- I, I know so much, all of this was Michael Landon, but has there ever been talk about saying, let's put them in the, the, the 20th century and let's do a 50 year reunion know, in New York God. or something. And let's be where right? these characters have gone. They, okay, the, the attempts at reboot, that is a whole, you can make a whole series about that at this point. Um, there have been many, 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 many almost reboots. And of course, uh, Troop Friendly, Son of Ed Friendly has the rights. Mm -hmm. And he actually uh, was shooting to try to make a feature film. And I think most re recently there was talk at Netflix. So there have been really since the late nineties, people have been almost rebooting this show. And but with you like, guys, because they've, they've done different casts, different versions. Yeah, yeah, guys. yeah. Because they've done stuff from the books or what. And that's the mm -hmm. other thing, like there was the musical and that was primarily taken from the books, Little Town on the Free, because you can do projects based on Laura's life or from the books. But reboot of the show since the late nineties, we'll get a phone call. Hey, it looks like they're doing it this time. Oh, where are they at? They're at this studio here. They've even, sometimes they even signed a director and writer. And we go, mm -hmm. ah, and then, you know how they, it's Hollywood. They, did the, they went to turn around and the thing, and then it didn't happen. And what so it's shame. been getting closer and closer <laughs> each time. And now we're getting really old. Um, it would be kind of weird. I mean, if you followed the actual plot of these people, we're now in the 1920s. So mm -hmm. Rose Wilder, Laura's baby, would be a grown-up famous writer and living in San Francisco with her husband. And Laura would be visiting her to go to the like Pacific uh, Exposition World's Fair at this point in the story. Um, Nellie would be long gone to Oregon. Um, a lot of people would be dead. And then, of course, then you have the real life. There was be some people who were still alive in the 20s who, of course, are not alive now. And so it would be very complicated. I don't know mm -hmm. what exactly they would do. So, so let me ask you, which, which characters on the show were completely made up for the series and which ones were, even if they were just based on the books, right. came from the books? Okay. That's a good uh, question. Yeah. Like Albert Ingalls. There, 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 is, there is no Albert Ingalls. I know this mm -hmm. is heartbreaking for people. There is no Albert Ingalls. Um, Matt Laberto, who, if you haven't had him on, you must. He is hilarious. I he totally always, want like, him on. He's Let's like, put that out there I, right now. I, I say there is an Albert Ingalls because there was the whole thing of like, there was the episode where he got on drugs and they got him off drugs. And then Laura's narration at the end says, and then it came back and he was Dr. Albert Ingalls. And then, of course, a couple and of he seasons died. later, he dies. Yeah. Um, so what was <laughs> that all about well the writers remember a long time ago the writers said well what are people gonna do watch all the episodes back to back i mean that's physically impossible because <laughs> we didn't need who wow. knew so they would know it'll remember this if there's summer reruns they'd be run at once it's not like they rerun things over and over again um so Unreal. yeah there was, what are they gonna do stream it or something so, yeah, we, yeah there were no dvds there was nothing so we had no concept so 
Now, Matt, of course, says, no, I died, but you know, you never saw the body. They say I'm dead. I believe I had an off-camera miraculous recovery at the last minute and did go on to be Dr. <laughs> From, le from, le from leukemia before there was any kind of treatment yeah. for it. Right. Yeah, because yeah. it was a miracle. Because it was a miracle. They had miracles on the show all the time. They had miracles. So, yeah. yeah, so he's going, he said, yeah, no, Albert is totally made up. They decided that he had played Charles as a young kid mm. in an episode flashback, and they really liked him, and Michael liked him and went, eh, get a kid on the show. Because what's weird is the Ingalls did have a baby boy who died tragically mm -hmm. in infancy. That's not in the books because... Well, the family, frankly, was quite traumatized. And Laura did not write about it in the books because it was much too upsetting since she was now targeting the books to nine-year-old girls. Mm -hmm. It was too weird. And the family was like, yeah, we still don't talk about it. So it was like they didn't put it in the book. But it did happen. And then we put it in the show, which is crazy because we put a thing in the show that really happened in real life but was not in the book. So that happened. Um, Mr. Edwards, sort of. He's in the books, but in real life, there was some guy with another name from Tennessee who they were friends with. So like a couple of people kind of in real life became Mr. Edwards. Nellie Olson, there was a girl named Nellie Owens, a girl named Stella Gilbert, and a girl named Genevieve Masters. And it appears that these three people were combined indeed to become the character of Nellie that we know. Um, and that was even in the books. So that went over. There's practically no Mrs. Olson in the books. Mm. Mr. Olson appears briefly in a couple moments. Nellie after On the Banks of Plum Creek is huge by Little Town on the Prairie, but there's very little Mr. Olson and Mrs. Olson, it's mentioned that he has a wife and she's in the store, but it's like, who? And they're not mm -hmm. named Harriet or Nels or anything. There's no discussion of what their names are. And in real life, their names were Margaret and William. So a lot of that got made up. Um, I don't think there was a Doc Baker, who was a doctor. There was a Dr. Tan, who's a big deal in one of the books, but- Was there um, a Mr. Mr. Hansen? I don't think so. And then, uh, oh, now the Reverend, there was a Reverend Alden. Mm. And there was some definitely some changes and mixing and matching of reverends and combining stuff. But there was a Reverend Alden and there was a doctor, but I don't think he was Baker. And there sort of kind of was a Mr. Edwards with a different name and three people were in LA. And then every people, there was a Miss Beetle, Miss Beetle, they kind of, oh. that's from the books. So they had a Miss Beetle and she's very like in the books. Um, and then they did, there's a lot of just making people up like left and right. There was mm -hmm. a baby Grace, there's baby, baby Carrie, baby Grace and baby Rose, um, but there's no Albert. Um, and then like all that stuff, like the banker and all these like various- The Garveys, like, were, the, were the Garveys in Garveys the are totally made up. That's what I yeah. thought. Be sure to watch for part two of my interview with Allison Arngrim as she answers even more in-depth Little House on the Prairie questions coming in the next two weeks. Thank you.